Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. It's just gone one o'clock so I'm just going to give everyone a chance to join. Um, do feel free to drop into the Q&A box and say hi. We've disabled the chat feature as we've discovered it can cause problems for some people using screen readers. So I'm just going to leave it a few moments for more people to arrive and then we'll get started. Hi Gizzy from gorgeously sunny South Wales. Yeah, it's gorgeously sunny here in Hastings as well. So I can see lots more people have arrived. So just give it a few more moments. Okay. I'm glad you could all make it today. I think we'll, we'll give, it a, give it a start now. Um, so hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is uh, a higher education public sector update addressing autism, dyslexia and neurodivergence in education and work. It's Neurodiversity Celebration Week this week, um, which is a worldwide initiative that challenges stereotypes and misconceptions about autism and learning disabilities. So it's a really perfect time to be running this session. My name is Annie Mannion and I'm Digital Marketing Manager at AbilityNet and I'll be running you through what you can expect from today. So just to go through a few bits of housekeeping, uh, we have live captions on the webinar which are provided by MyClearText. So thank you Kim who's doing those in the background. Uh, you can turn those on using the closed caption option on the control panel and additional captions are also available at streamtext.net forward slash player question mark event equals ability net and also slides are available at slideshare.net forward slash ability net and also on our website at forward slash neurodivergence dash webinar um, if you have any technical issues or you need to leave early don't worry you'll receive an email uh, with the recording the transcript and the slides on thursday afternoon and also depending on how you joined the webinar um, you'll find a q a window so if you'd like to ask any of the speakers any questions, uh, do drop those into the Q&A area and we'll address those later on or if we don't get to them um, then after today's session on our website. And then finally, we just have a feedback page you'll be directed to at the end, so please do complete that. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. So for those of you who aren't yet familiar with AbilityNet, uh, we support people of any age living with any disability or impairment to use technology to achieve their goals at home, at work and in education. And we do this by providing specialist advice, services, free information resources like this webinar. And I'll share a little more about our services at the end. Okay, um, next slide, please. So today we're joined by Rob Howe, who is Head of Learning Technology at the University of Northampton and by Jenny Detmer, who is Acting Senior Professional and Academic Development Tutor at the University of Bedfordshire. Uh, also joining us is Helen Wicks, who's Education and Workplace Relationship Manager at AbilityNet, and she's going to provide an update on the public sector body's accessibility regulations. And we've also got Theresa Loftus, who's Assessment Team Manager at AbilityNet, and she's going to be discussing the disabled students' allowances and also highlighting the issues that some people may face in the transition from education to work, um, looking at reasonable adjustments that may, may need to be provided as well. So just before Helen kicks off today's webinar content, I'm just going to start with a poll. So let me just launch the poll. So, so we can have a bit more understanding about who's joining us today. Can you tell us who are you? Are you a digital professional? a university professional, a public sector professional, so non-university, a student with a neurodivergent condition, a professional with a neurodivergent condition, a student or other. So again, um, depending on how you've joined the webinar, you may not be able to see the poll, but you can respond in the Q&A panel. So I'll just leave it a bit longer for everybody to vote.
Okay, a few more moments for everybody. Okay, I'm just going to end the poll now. And if I share the results, uh, it's a fairly broad cross section, but um, yeah, most people here are university professionals. Uh, so that is 58%. Um, uh, then we have, who's next on here? Um, public sector employees, non-university, that's 18%. Um, a professional with a neurodivergent condition, 9%. Digital professionals, 7%. Other, 6%. Um, students, 1%. And at the moment, we don't have any students with a neurodivergent condition um, noted on, on the session today. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll now and um, hand over to Helen to share uh, a bit more about digital accessibility regulations. Brilliant. Thanks, Annie. Um, so, yeah, so I think on our, on our last webinar, if anyone joined us, um, we were talking about a uh, report that was going to be published. Um, so um, if you go to the next slide, um, Kelly, for me. Um, so the accessibility monitoring of public sector websites, websites and mobile apps 2020 2021 report um, was published on the 20th of December 2021. Um, so I don't know if how many people may have managed to have a look at the report, um, but we will share the, um, the link for it as well um, as part of the follow up um, or in the, the Q&A shortly for you as well. So you can have a look if you haven't done so already. Um, but just wanted to pull out some of the key points that they, um, they mentioned in there for people to be um, thinking about and being aware of. Um, so obviously, uh, most people are aware that the regulations came into force over the last couple of years um, and they've been monitoring um, since then. So they said um, accessibility issues were found on nearly all of the websites that they tested. Um, so not many websites that they didn't give a percentage, but um, pretty much every website they tested, there were issues on them. Um, what they do then is they send a um, report to the website owners, um, giving them time to fix those issues, um, which is normally a 12 week, um, 12 week window to, to be able to fix those issues. Um, and they said um, that 59% of those had come back within that time frame and had fixed the issues found, or at least had um, some short term timelines in place for when the website would be fixed. Um, so it's just kind of important to show that they are doing the monitoring and they are sending out those um, uh, those reports to people to make sure those fixes are being made. Um, some of the main issues that they found were lack of visible focus. Um, so that's something that's really important for keyboard users and then also low contrast, um, uh, color code contrast, which again obviously is um, effective for visual impaired users. Um, so there were a couple of the main issues that they found on, um, on the websites that they were testing. Um, the next thing that they um, discovered was around the accessibility statement. So this was something that was new um, when the regulations came into place um, and is a new requirement for all websites. Um, what they found was um, whilst um, most websites had the accessibility statements, 90% um, of those actually um, had um, contained um, information that wasn't um, quite correct. It didn't have all the required information within them. Um, so 90% so of the websites had statements, but only 7% um, actually were fully compliant within their statements of everything that needed to be in there. Um, so it's just to kind of remember that the statements do need to be kept up to date. Lots of the statements were written when the regulations came to force. Um, so they, um, they do need to be monitored and kept to date um, as time goes on. Obviously, things are changing um, with everything that you're doing. Um, so you just need to make, keep aware of those um, and go back, especially if it hasn't been reviewed since the regulations came to place um, back in 2018 for new websites and September 2019 for all your remaining sites. So it is worth just going back and reviewing those and making sure that they are compliant still um, with how you are now. Um, so, um, and then just to say, so um, if you like I said, if you haven't looked at the report, we'll send you the, um, the link through, but um, there's three different types of testing that they do. Um, there's their simplified testing, which just covers a small sample page of, um, sample of pages um, they do go into detailed testing and then there's also the mobile app testing um, but then as i said um, in the report they tell you kind of how they're doing those testings what they're looking at what they're doing um, and what the process is after that if 
in terms of them sending you the report and the timeframes and everything that you would have to, to rectify those. Um, so it's definitely worth going and having a look at the report um, if you haven't done so already, um, and just to be thinking of those key issues that they have found um, when, when doing that monitoring. So um, they haven't um, said when maybe the next report will come out, but we'll keep, keep you updated on that as well. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. And then I just wanted to um, let you know about um, some training that we have coming up. So some of you may have joined us for our Don't Disable Me webinar a few weeks ago. Um, and we've got some training that um, follows on from that, which is, again, called our Don't Disable Me series of training. Um, within this training, we've got um, Ability Next Workplace Inclusion Experts, um, and they provide a deep dive into the experiences of people living with different disabilities and impairments. Um, each of the sessions are led by individuals with lived experiences, um, and they're sharing kind of the common barriers that people encounter um, at work, in study, and in their day-to-day -day life. Um, the kinds of assistive technologies and tools that people um, use to overcome these barriers, and the steps that everyone can take to avoid creating barriers in the first place. Um, so we do have our physical barrier session actually taking place tomorrow, um, but we have all the other ones coming up over the next few weeks, and our neurodiverse one is on the um, 4th of May, I believe. Um, so um, please do um, check those out on our website, and um, they're quite useful for, for people to, to attend to say, talk about those different barriers that people are facing. Uh, next slide, please, Kelly. And then also then similarly to that um, kind of ties in with it is just if you're looking at things for kind of your all staff um, to try and make them aware um, of things, you know, teaching your staff about accessibility and inclusion, then our e-learning options are a great way to look at those as well um, to be able to yeah, get across all your staff um, the the things like the, um, the business case, the legal and the moral reasons for um, getting the things right. Um, and then we touch on things like the languages, do's and don'ts, um, the common accessibility issues. Again, the person-centered um, real life experience of what people experience and how they can you can help overcome those for them. The assistive technologies used, um, and then also those practical um, advice to create to um, not create those barriers in the first place, hopefully, um, and also step-by-step -step guides in how to create accessible content. Um, so just those two things kind of tying together um, uh, to look at those. And so I just wanted to make you aware of some of those services that we have. Um, but I'm going to pass you over now to, um, to Jenny and Rob um, to talk about um, their things. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Halm, have learned technology at the University of Northampton, and I'm joined with uh, Jenny Detmer, who's Acting Senior Professional and Academic Development Tutor at the University of Bedfordshire. And we're going to talk to you today about neurodivergence and online learning through the pandemic. So next slide, please. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a session uh, that we actually ran last year uh, as part of the All of East Ling England uh, group and particularly we're going to focus a little bit today on what is neurodiversity and neurodivergence pick out some of the key findings really from the the session that hopefully you'll find useful and also then lead on to some of the tips and recommendations for any other teams that are actually supporting neurodivergent students just based on some of the things that we've actually found um, and then finally we're just going to finish off with a, a call to action of things that you can look at and further resources. Next slide, please. So the session that uh, we actually hosted, as I say, um, it was planned really through the Alt East England group. Um, and we held the session on the 10th of June, uh, 2021. Uh, we had five students uh, with neurodivergent needs. And what we wanted to do as part of the session was particularly to focus on the impact of COVID um, on them, and particularly to look at their experiences at the different institutions and the degree to which those institutions actually um, help the students through that particular requirements at that time. Next slide, please. So first of all, what do we mean by the term neurodiversity? Well, the term neurodiversity was originally um, attributed to autism and was coined in the late 1990s by Judy Singer. Singer believed that autism should be viewed more positively within the ethos of the social model of disability, where many of the barriers for autistic people are caused by society itself. 
Nowadays, neurodivergence is used to refer to a range of conditions, including autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, dyscalculia, and Tourette's syndrome. These differences should be accepted and celebrated. We know that there is an increasing number of neurodivergent students entering higher education in the UK. And under the 2010 Equalities Act, neurodivergent students should expect equal access to their learning. Additionally, in support of the neurodiversity movement, neurodivergent individuals should be included in how best to be supported at higher education institutions as they are experts in their own conditions. Next slide, please. What this diagram shows is that a particular neurodivergence often shares features of others. Apologies if aspects of this slide are too small to read at the moment, but you can, of course, refer back to the diagram after the webinar in the slide deck. It's also interesting to note that there is a high rate of co-occurrence within and external to neurodivergence. And interestingly, none of the five students who participated in our event presented with just one difference. Next slide, please. So some key findings actually from the, the session itself, um, and we've picked out six that we're going to just talk about today. The first of these is the responsiveness of tutors. Students often found that tutors were more responsive to questions and queries online, especially the use of synchronous environments such as Microsoft Teams made it easier to contact tutors in real time and then talk to them. The additional means to communicate and reach the tutors beyond email was highlighted as a real benefit for online learning for the students that we were speaking to. The second item there is about working with peers online. For some of the students, the move to art learning online changed the way they were engaging with peers. The student with Asperger's found it easier to engage with small groups of students in virtual breakout rooms, while often working in isolation when they were actually in large face-to-face -face lectures and group work. So for them, it was, a, it was a real change. It was the first time in their studies that this student was actually able to interact with other students. To enable this interaction, it was important for this student that participation in the breakout room, switching on their cameras to actually put a face to a name. This enabled them to connect and get to know each other. However, the debate about switching the cameras on and off is actually still contentious. One student with dyslexia and ADHD noted that the sharing of cameras should still be optional. However, it was acknowledged that it was essential for those who relied on lip reading. The use of cameras tended to be more successful where students were already comfortable working together. Students did appreciate that the choice of cameras may be also down to personal situations. In some cases, students may not be comfortable sharing their home environment. In other cases, there may be a technical reason, such as poor Wi-Fi, that prevents the camera from actually being on. One student with Asperger's, dyspraxia, and being assessed for dyslexia noted that it was very distracting if the video feeds were not stable. And for them, this actually impacted on the value of the whole session. However, the online environment requires students to adopt and sometimes develop new learning and coping strategies for processing and retaining information through the online learning and interaction. One student with Asperger's and ADHD, for example, found that their retention of information was different when learning online and they actually found it more difficult to explain and feedback what they actually knew. The third item on the slide is around increased control over their time and environment. When moving to an online learning environment, neurodivergent students reported that they had more flexibility over their routine, especially for students with ADHD and anxiety, studying at home lowered the necessity for mentally preparing every step from getting up planning the journey to campus and moving between different locations on campus. 
The benefit of choice and flexibility also carried over where courses changed from traditional to online or open book exams. One of the students on the session with Asperger's and ADHD noted that moving to online assessments meant that it was much easier for them to actually work in a place of their choice over a long period of time. Another student with ADHD reflected on the fact that they were able to select when to start their time-based assessment within a given window, of course, which lowered their stress levels and allowed for better planning of time and breaks and helped them concentrate more fully on the assessment. The ability to work in their own location also reduced the stress of trying to find the exam hall and become familiar with a new environment. One of the students with Asperger's and dyspraxia pointed out that they were able to see improvements in their grades post pandemic as the open book nature of some assessments was more suited to their way of working. The fourth item on the slide is around the ability to focus when studying online. The challenge of maintaining focus is a major characteristic of conditions such as dyslexia, ADHD and dyspraxia. A student with Asperger's and dyspraxia, for instance, found it easy to concentrate if they were also sketching. Working alone online also meant that they felt less inhibited, especially if their webcam was turned off. However, studying in a physical environment, normally associated with relaxation, was a difficult transition for a student with ADHD, especially when there are personal distractions in the room, such as Netflix. Likewise, focusing on online conversations was also difficult due to the lack of social cues. Social cues are a way to know whether the other students online were listening or not. And for a student with ADHD and depression, social cues are an important part of conversing with others. The fifth item on the slide is around lack of physical presence. The lack of physical presence made one student with depression and panic disorder uncertain and uncomfortable about gaining the opportunity to speak to lecturers. In addition, students who studied practical subjects felt they were disadvantaged because the digital adjustments were inadequate. One student said that they chose a specific course because they preferred a hands-on learning style and the student felt that they had a lesser experience learning in the digital realm due to the lack of kinesthetics. The final item on the slide is around changes to practical assessment and adjustments. The suitability of practical adjustments was most stark with assessments. The change to certain types of assessment, for example, timed essays, was not always seen as supporting those with neurodivergence. One of the students with ADHD noted that institutions seem to be measuring how fast a student can write down facts when for them using the timing productively and structuring the essays in a reduced time was problematic. One student with panic disorder and anxiety interestingly noted that institutional policies for adding extensions to every assessment gave them more time to be stressed and aggravated their panic disorder. These students would have preferred adaptions like a no detriment policy and just have the option for an extension if they actually chose it. Two students with ADHD noted issues in dealing with their institution. On some occasions, institutional replies regarding accommodating specific needs on an assessment were being sent out after the actual deadline. On other occasions, broken personal laptops and isolation issues were not considered as reasons to grant an extension, as the students were already seen as having accommodations for their learning disabilities. Next slide, please. So from the um, information uh, that we actually got from the student itself, we came up with a number of sort of tips and recommendations for other teams on supporting neurodiversity, just based on our, our findings particularly. The first one of these is that students should make institutions aware of their neurodivergence using the recognised channels. Ideally, this should be done on their UCAS forms when they apply for a place at university so that the university can contact them regarding their needs. However, students may not choose to disclose their differences on the UCAS form as they believe it will affect their chances of being accepted on a course. Additionally, students needs change over time. So when filling in the form, they may or may not be accurate. The next point is around institutions should ensure that all relevant staff are aware of students who have declared spe specific needs. This allows the staff to adjust their inclusive teaching practices accordingly. 
Students may also have complex needs based on their neurodivergence and staff need to be aware of the best ways to support them. Training should be available at higher education institutions so that staff can support students effectively within their lectures and tutorials. Finally, institutions need to anticipate that students may not have declared the needs, but actually just manage sensible adaptations which benefit the whole student cohort. This is why inclusive teaching practices are important and all staff should be aware what they are and how to include them in their sessions. Next slide, please. So if you are interested in reading the findings from this event, then you can read in more detail about it in our three blog posts, which we've had published from Alt-C. And the link for all three of these blog posts can be found on the useful link section of the webinar page on the AbilityNet website. Um, of the three blog posts, the first blog post looks at what is neurodiversity. The second focuses on neurodivergent students studying in the home environment. And the third centers on recommendations from the support perspectives. And if you're interested in finding out more about the Association of Learning Technology East of England group, the link will also be available on the webinar page. Another group that may be of interest to you is the Association of Learning Development in Higher Education, Neurodiversity and Inclusivity Community of Practice that I co-chair. Again, the links to further information and the expression of interest form can be found in the useful links section of the web page. So thank you for listening to our summary of the Alt East England event, where five students with neurodivergent needs focused on the impact of COVID and their experiences at their different institutions. That brings us to the end of our input today, but if you do have any questions, there'll be time for them at the end of the session. So thank you for listening. So um, thanks, Rob and Jenny. Um, yeah, we've had loads of questions in so far, so we'll cover these at the end of the webinar um, and do, do continue to, to put more questions into the Q&A panel uh, if you'd like to pose them to any of the panel. Um, but now over to Teresa to talk about disabled students' allowances. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, so my name's Teresa Loftus. I'm from MobilityNet and um, I'm a DSA assessor and a workplace assessor as well. And uh, just bear with me while I'm just trying to set my screen up as well. It suddenly went into a bit of a hiccup. So um, I've now sorted myself out. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to speak to you about um, the barriers and solutions for people with neurodivergent uh, conditions when studying or when working. And so um, really assessors, uh, when somebody comes along for an assessment, rely on a diagnostic or consultant report of pre-assessment information. And uh, they also rely on speaking with the student when they're conducting a DSA assessment as well. And some of that information is true when you're doing a workplace assessment, uh, although we don't always have uh, access to the medical information or a diagnostic report. So uh, we're just relying on uh, speaking to the uh, to the client at that time. So when we think about DSA assessments and discussions, there's 10 areas that we tend to cover and uh, those I'm going to speak a little bit about. So some of those areas are things like reading and research writing and reviewing your work, note taking in lectures and managing time and organizing work. There's things like practicals as well and social interaction and communication and then travel too. So we'll, we'll have a little look at the types of barriers and solutions that uh, might come up. Our assessments actually are very informal and often students expect there to be a test and there isn't. So quite often they turn up and they're very nervous about uh, having a chat with us. And uh, so they're actually really friendly and, and uh, we realise that it can be difficult for some people due to the feelings of anxiety, for instance, when they come along. So through discussion and demonstrations, uh, we identify what the student feels most comfortable with to help minimise the barriers when studying. And these may be free and built solutions on their computers or DSA funded tech. And we also speak about other forms of help, such as non-medical help and uh, travel support too. 
So firstly, um, thinking about reading and research. So Barry has often spoken about a poor focus, being easily distracted, rereading or jumping lines of text, reading but not taking anything in, feeling overwhelmed, poor note taking strategies, reading more than needed and following a line of interest to the detriment of keeping on track with coursework. And so where we where somebody would find it easier to listen rather than to read, there's software such as text to speech that can be really helpful. Quite often people aren't aware of the free solution here. So in Microsoft Office 365, you might be able to access some basic information with um, text to speech solutions, but also that uh, immersive reader in Office 365 is really useful because it can convert the text that you're reading, it'll open up into a new window and it will make lines shorter if you want them or longer. So it'll make a, that reading a little bit more accessible for you. It could also be about changing the background colors as well to reduce some visual fatigue. So you could choose a color or you could adapt the color to suit your specific need. And there's line focus. So that creates a bit of a letterbox view on your screen. So that uh, means that information is less overwhelming. You've got a, a sort of a decluttered screen that you can look at. Um, and the speech option actually allows you to speed up the speech or slow it down as, a, as and when you want to. And uh, you've got a few options of uh, different voices too. You can all, also use some of these solutions within Edge when you're searching the internet and accessing PDF documents. And that's really useful because you can convert some of the text into speech and you can also write and annotate within Edge as well and save that document for future reference. So those free solutions are a great, great stepping stone there. And of course, if they don't work and you need something a little bit more, that's where DSA can come in and, and step in and provide some help. So there's some good options there for you that go a little bit further and provide text to speech organization of research and predictive text to and dictionaries highlighting and extraction of key points and converting text into audio files all within one piece of software and that's like things like text help and claro that can do that for you and uh, often these solutions work across multiple platforms and devices too so it means that you can access it where and when you want to it's not always about access to text through alternative formats it might be about organization of your notes and again, free solutions such as OneNote is great. That organizes your notes through color-coded tabs and allows you to draw or type and write and record information. So you can actually record your voice and uh, again, some of your notes to refer back to later. And then moving on from that, there's the DSA funded option that allows you to integrate some of those solutions across sort of like other assistive software that's been recommended for you. So you can combine two solutions together. So things like using Pro Study with mind maps, for instance. So Pro Study, just to recap, is an organizational piece of software that is DSA funded and, and uh, is just one step up on, on the OneNote option that I've just spoken about. It might also be that switching between screens is quite difficult or you looking at your keyboard, looking up at the screen is quite difficult. So you might want to think about dictation software, which can, again, be really helpful in, in uh, reducing that impact of sort of like bobbing up and down between screens because you lose where you are when you're typing. Or it could be that you lose your train of thought and you want to get your ideas out really, really fast. So dictation is a really good way of doing that. There's inbuilt solutions there again, which are free, which is Dictate in Microsoft Office. So you, when you have a look on Microsoft Word, for instance, you can see the Dictate function up there on the screen. If you're using lots of different types of software, it might be that you want to consider using Dragon, naturally speaking, which will work again across multiple platforms for you too. So it depends what you're doing and how you're working. And the assessor will talk to you about that to try and help identify which works for you. And again, they'll give you demonstrations of that too. So the next area is about writing and reviewing your work. So organizing your ideas and breaking assignments down into manageable, chunk, manageable chunks would make essay writing feel a little less overwhelming. So mind maps are great for this and they're solutions that um, are 
also convert your mind map into a Word document. So that process of writing up an assignment is streamlined for you and it makes it feel a lot more manageable. We also remind students about the editor function in Word as well. So that's the inbuilt solution that can check for your spellings, but also for your grammar, clarity and conciseness too. And there's more that it does there. And, uh, you know, it, it will also help you with looking at inclusive language. So do have a look at the settings there to see if there's more that you want to be doing within the editor function in Word. So note taken in lectures. So again, that can be quite anxiety inducing, not only with keeping pace with what's being said, but it also might be the this the area that you're working in or the, the sensory overload that you might feel with the environment that you're in. And that affects the way in which you actually listen to information and take notes. So during the pandemic, it was really helpful because actually a lot of um, universities went online and you could access information in your own room or lectures were recorded. So you could listen to that, um, a lecture in your own time because they were recorded. So it's, it's really helpful. You can stop it and pause it and get back to it wherever when you want to. It's not always possible that those lecturers, um, those lecture recordings are available to you or it's not being applied um, for whatever reason. And then so DSA can fund a different solution there for you as well. So those solutions could be in the form of a digital voice recorder, depending on the environment that you're working in, or it could be an app that goes on your phone or on your laptop or a mixture of both. So when we think about sort of the, the software that could support you through DSA funding, there's some really good choices there that can record the, um, the lecture when it's combined with the PowerPoint slide and you can pinpoint different areas to be able to get back to sp specific points to be able to review them in your own time. And it saves you having to go back through a whole lecture in one session. So you can actually identify where you need to get back to very, very quickly. So managing time and organizing work, and this is where students can find they're overwhelmed with deadlines and their ability to prioritize tasks may be diminished and anxiety exacerbated by the constant need to keep on track. It's not always about using tech, though, as reminders set on the phone can be easily swiped away. And that's often something that's said to us during assessments that they just swipe it away and don't worry about it. Um, although it does create anxiety later on because they're not keeping up. So students very often say they want a visual reminder as they walk in and out of their room. So academic wall calendars are really useful in this, this sort of scenario. And again, that's DSA fundable. Outlook calendars provide a good solution and you can color code those free solution and they can connect up with to do lists. Alternatively, you might want to have a look at an app that uh, allows you to hide some tasks and highlight others so that you can prioritize what you need to, but don't feel overwhelmed by the large amount of um, tasks that are, are ahead of you. So again, assessors will just demonstrate the one that best suits the individual that, uh, and the barriers that they're experiencing. When we think about social interaction and communication, um, this can pose a sort of like a spike in anxiety. And when somebody feels really anxious, they can't sort of get the ideas together that they want to, or it might affect their communication as well. And, and speaking fluently in public could be posing a problem. So we can think about like group work or even presentations. So when we think about presentations, a free solution that's really helpful is something like Rehearse with Coach in PowerPoint. It's a place where you can practice your presentation and go back and review it. And that will um, software will actually analyze what you've been saying, whether it's actually a duplication of exactly what's on the slide for you there. So do have a look at Coach um, Rehearse with Coach in PowerPoint. It's a good one to work with. Travelling to and from university and sort of like those late changes as well, um, when we've got uh, room changes. So if we're travelling to and from university, you might have be travelling on train and there might be something that happens that causes anxiety and uh, you can't collect your thoughts well in the, in the way that you would like to. Um, means that you freeze and can't uh, contact any, anybody that you would normally speak to for help. And uh, there's some good solutions there to help overcome those barriers. And uh, I think one of the 
really powerful ones is Brain in Hand. And it's so very helpful. In fact, it provides you with a, a traffic light sy system of support whereby you can escalate the strategies from working through the solutions, through known solutions that you've come up with before, or actually going to sort of like the red, I need to contact somebody via email, text or phone. So Brain in Hand is a good DSA fundable solution that works well for individuals here. So I've covered quite a few areas there and uh, there, there's an awful lot to take on board. And um, whilst I've spoken about the um, assistive technology, the free solutions and the DSA funded solutions, there's also non-medical help. So you could actually access um, specialist study skills support on a one-to-one -one basis and you could have that on a weekly basis we could have specialist mentoring again on a weekly basis if you required it and uh, you would need to be discussing with the with the assessor what the barriers are and and uh, so that we've got justification to be able to put forward to student finance in order for that to be um, supported for you the ultimate goal here though is getting out to work and uh, that transition from education into work can feel quite daunting and uh, we've spoken about all of the solutions here and worrying about whether you've still got those when you go into the workplace is of concern to some so there is a solution called access to work and it's a government funded scheme it's not not really well known about and uh, in fact it's very similar to the DSA assessment uh, and, and an assessor would talk through all the barriers that will be experienced in the workplace and identify some of the solutions very similar to what's been um, provided for you within the DSA funded solutions as well. So it's not too different. It's just a different scheme. AbilityNet, I've got a fact sheet about it as well. So please do have a look at it and if it's something that you feel would be useful. So that's on our AbilityNet website. So Helen um, spoke to you briefly about um, some of the series that uh, AbilityNet run and uh, such as the lived experience. And again, that's really useful to go to. It's uh, good for employers, tutors, lecturers, for instance. Uh, it, they're led by our individuals who share common barriers encountered at work, in study and in their day to day life and the kinds of, of assistive technologies and tools that they use to overcome the barriers and steps that everyone can take to avoid creating the barriers in the first place. Really do recommend that uh, those are access to create a bit of empathy and allyship in, in supporting people within work and within education. And again, we've got our e-learning modules too to support that workplace and, uh, and transition. And uh, they take sort of a, a broader look at the types of um, support that can be implemented. I've, I've covered quite a lot here and uh, taken you through some of the DSA funded solutions and access to work and uh, raising awareness through sort of like our ability net tools and training. And uh, hopefully that's been quite useful to you. And I'm going to hand you back now to the safe hands of Annie. Yeah, thanks so much, Teresa, um, for sharing that valuable whistle stop tour. Um, lots to digest there. Um, we've had loads of questions through. So um, if I could ask um, uh, Jenny and Rob and Helen to come back on as panelists, that would be great. Um, and I will, I will pull out some of the questions that we've had through. Um, there's, yeah, like I say, we've got lots to, to have a look at. So if I just pick one out to start with. Um, do you have any advice about how to help students that don't have the correct paperwork and documentation required to get, um, oh, the question has gone to get uh, DSA funding for many minority groups. There's a lot of inequality when it comes to getting correct diagnosis. I don't know if anyone's able to answer that question or if it's one that we come back to. I think we'd have to come back to that one and we'd need to know the specifics on that as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that one at the moment. I'm very sorry. OK, yeah, that's fine. Um, are there any examples of staffing policy on neurodiversity that uh, anyone's able to share some information about? 
for um, a similar question about in, internal tra new training options for neurodiversity within workplaces? Um, staff and policy, um, something I can kind of have a look into, see if we've got any um, guidelines. Um, we haven't I've got anything specific, but I can certainly look into um, it's something that we could have a look at pulling together. Um, yeah, training options, again, as we've spoken of for, from an ability net side, we've got our lived experience sessions, the learning options um, that specifically um, focus on neurodiversity. Um, they're some of the options that we um, that we have and some of our past webinars as well, I think probably um, that we could could link to as well some of our other um, past free webinars that we've done um, have touched on neurodiversity as well, so they might be worth having a look at, um, especially the don't disable me one that did have our um, colleague Rena on it, um, who um, delivers our neurodiverse um, lived experience training and she talked on that webinar um, quite specifically about her. Um, the barriers that she faces and and some examples and stuff that she she gave on there so that one's definitely worth um a watch back and listen to as well if um um yeah yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd add to that as well because we've got a lovely one um within those lived experiences which is the hearing impairment with dyslexia as well because we know that those conditions aren't just separate there's they they you know it, 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 there's other uh, other disabilities that uh, co-occur as well so um yeah have a look at quite a few of those there's hearing impairment with dyslexia that's that's worth investigating as well and we can um share lots of the um useful links within the web page that um you'll be sent on thursday um afternoon as well so you'll be able to access the recording slides the transcripts and q and a's and useful links so we'll include those um, there as well. Um, I think uh, th th there are a few people asking for any um, recommendations or suggestions of um, accessible mind map tools. Is that something you're able to share information about now or um, further, further down the line in the, the Q&As? Um, when you talk about accessible mind mapping software, um, it, it depends what what you're wanting to use use it with um you'd probably want to have a look at um the wcag statements and the vpat statements of this of different softwares to see whether it's accessible or compatible with the types of software that's being used um we know that uh there are quite a few funded through dsa and uh, we look at MindView and Inspiration as a couple of them. There's also other ones as well. MindView is um, an accessible piece of software that uh, from looking at the um, WCAB statement, I haven't looked at Inspiration, so um, but uh, it's also well worth looking at that one as well because it's also working out whether it's something that meets your needs with regards to the way of, of, of it being laid out and presented to you um, as well because they've got two very different views and ways of working when you're using those different bits of software. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, a question for, for Jenny and Rob, um, do, or, uh, well for everybody really, but uh, is the increasing number of neurodivergent students in HE due to widening access or could it be due to students feeling more comfortable disclosing I just wondered what your impressions were from from the people you've worked with. Yeah, it, it can be a mix and it depends on students' previous experiences, really. So if they've had a really positive experience at school, then they are happy disclosing when they come to university. But, you know, the opposite is also true. If they haven't had a positive experience at school, then they tend not to want to disclose. They also think that maybe they won't be accepted within their peer group at university and also issues around admissions onto the course, especially for students who are applying for professional courses like nursing and teaching. And there's still a lot of stigma around disclosing um, neurodivergence for those courses. Um, but yes, definitely, I think that you know, the WP policies from universities have had a positive impact on the number of uh, neurodivergent students coming into HE. Um, and also, you know, the access to the DSA as well, that students have been able to receive financial support 
um, at university has also had a big impact. Um, there's been better support in the compulsory education sector and also once they come into higher education as well. So everything's really had a positive impact on improving the numbers coming in. But the numbers we see in, in higher education don't reflect the, the numbers in the general population. So there are still people coming into higher education that aren't saying that they have a neurodivergence. So it's really important. And I know some people were saying in the chat as well, you know, what do you do if you haven't got the paperwork, if you haven't got the diagnosis? And this is why it's really important that we do have the inclusive teaching practices present um, in our higher education institutions and, and students can always access support um, from their support teams. I know at the University of Bedfordshire, we support students as well without um, a diagnosis, um, whether that be, you know, in a one to one or a drop in situation. So there should always be support available to students, whether or not they have a diagnosis. Yeah, and a, a related question. Um, uh, Jennifer has, has asked in the, the Q&A, um, we're finding several members of staff self-diagnosing as neurodivergent um, through increased awareness. Uh, do, do you have any information about how to get diagnosed? That might be one for Teresa as yeah. well. <laughs> as, as well. <laughs> I, I think if you go to, um, I think it's Dyslexia Association website to have a look. Um, it's uh, quite often uh, people don't really need to go for a diagnostic um, assessment because they know the barriers that they're experiencing. So some of the solutions that you might find are helpful to you in the workplace are free solutions within your computer settings. And so if you have a look on the AbilityNet website, we've got My Computer My Way, for instance, or if you have a look at our website um, on their fact sheets, again, it can pinpoint you in the right direction to get some ideas of how you can adapt your computer to suit your specific needs. So there's an awful lot out there that you can do just to overcome some of those barriers. So it's not always about sort of like getting that diagnostic report just to support you and know that you 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 feel that you've got those conditions and those those difficulties but it's actually finding some solutions that would work for you as an interim maybe and do have a look at our website to support you there we've also got our free line our free services option as well so you can drop a message to AbilityNet to ask some questions there too and uh, we'll that sort of like asks all of the assessors I suppose in a sense and we can all put in an idea if we need to from there and then um, there's, there's a comment uh, that um, somebody has seen students receive excellent support uh, in academic environments through disabled students allowances, um, but they have not been able to take their equipment or their, their technology with them in the transition to the workplace. Um, is there any, you know, is there any support available for students transitioning um, that you're aware of? So DSA funded equipment, once once you've got your equipment, that's yours. So I'm not quite sure why you can't use that equipment, but having that software installed on your laptop, you quite often can't have that then installed into the workplace. So that's where the access to work might be supportive to you. So dependent on the organisation or organisation size and uh, it, it depends where the funding for that comes from. So it's well worth having a look at the access to work fact sheet of AbilityNet or it, as it's a government funded scheme, it's on sort of like the government websites as well. And you would very likely get all of that equipment in place for you within the workplace. So do have a look at it and raise your awareness about sort of like access to work, because yes, you wouldn't be able to take that license over into the new software because there might be a whole host of issues because it might be to do with security. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that you, you would speak to with regards to the HR, your onboarding when you're going into work as well. So uh, yeah, have a look, have discuss that with your employer and have a look at the access to work as I, as, um, website too. Okay, um, I was just gonna, sorry, I was just gonna add, that's the kind of um, 
thing as well, isn't it, about there is that disconnect between DSA and access to work and moving into the workplace and um, um, being able to approach that with your employers and hopefully employers are moving towards that more inclusive environment for all and not, you know, be people being able to disclose um, things when they when they do join the workforce, but also not having to and being able to have that kind of processes already in place, you know, through their recruitment and onboarding processes that um, maybe they've already got a suite of software and different things within the organisation, you know, that people can have. And um, yeah, just that, that kind of awareness of thinking about removing barriers across the board and not people be having to disclose all the time. Um, and yeah, just thinking about that inclusive work practices um, rather than always having to think about um, an individual's, you know, it becomes a, oh, by the way, um, I I need this or, or X, Y, Z or something. Um, but yeah, so just um, for employers to start thinking about it in, in that way as well, um, because there is that bit of disconnect between, between DSA and access to work and moving through at the moment. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, just looking at the time, I think we've got got time for just one quick question um, and this is this is probably for, for Jenny and Rob mostly but um, do feel free to chip in. Uh, somebody has asked what are your three top tips for university lecturers in terms of accessible education and supporting neurodivergent students? Well if you're looking at the the reasonable adjustments which are mostly made for students that you can bring into the classroom, I would say they would be making your lecture notes or an outline available before the session. And that would be at least 24 hours beforehand so that students who need to make accommodations to that um, can do. And so that they're not also having to make notes read and listen at the same time so that then there's not having a an information overload in the lectures so, so that's really important and i think that's probably the top one if you're going to do anything that is extremely helpful and as with all these inclusive teaching practices it's not just useful for neurodivergent or disabled students they're helpful for all students you know mature students international students home students for whom English is not their first language. So, I mean, that's the great thing about inclusive teaching practices. They work well for all students. Um, the second point would be to have personal recordings available for students. Now we saw when we went on to online teaching, they were readily available for students. Um, now we've gone back to the classroom depends on the IT systems that we've got in place. And, you know, and making sure that if we are recording live sessions to make sure that captions are also available for those sessions within two weeks of them being made available to students. And the third point would be around reading lists. So prioritizing reading lists. So what are the, the what's the core reading? What's supplementary? So students can then really focus in on what they need to be reading and making them available prior to a course as well. So students who need more time around reading have got that opportunity to do that. So there would be my three top tips. Excellent advice. Um, did you want to add anything as well, Rob? Yeah, the only thing I was just going to add was um, one of the things that we picked out was anything that reduces anxiety is, is particularly useful. And um, one of the things that I think I picked up when I was talking to the students was around uh, exam halls. And I know a lot of institutions at the moment are debating the whole nature of exams and whether they're needed and the stress that they actually give um, all students, actually. And Jenny was talking about, you know, universal design for everyone. Um, are they actually measuring what they, they need to measure or do they unnecessarily put people under stress where people need to go into a new environment such as an exam hall? Um, can we better prepare students in terms of the environment that they're actually going to face when they walk in there? For some students, that will be the first time that they've been into that particular location um, and they won't necessarily have any of the things which make it um, a normal environment for them. Um, actually, so instantly that, that can raise the stress levels above that. 
um, of potentially other students. And so I think anything that helps the students in terms of uh, making them feel more comfortable with that environment, I think would be really useful. But certainly all the things that, that Jenny mentioned obviously were, were really important, I think, for most institutions. Okay. I, I'd, I'd add sort of like just to add on those those really great points because actually if a student comes to us in a DSA assessment and raises those as some of the barriers that they experience we're not allowed to actually um, recommend what types of things the university puts in place but we can definitely put into the report the the, the barriers that are experienced and for you to then go ahead and have a discussion with a disability advisor at the university. So it's something that we can add in there that prompts that conversation to go forward. Fantastic. Um, yeah, just looking at the time, I'm afraid it's, it's time to end there. But thanks so much, Jenny, Rob, Teresa, Helen, um, some excellent discussion points and um, perfect timing for Neurodiversity Celebration Week this week. Um, just finally to close, um, just to let you know, we run some fantastic online training sessions on digital accessibility. Uh, you can find out more at abilitynet.org.uk forward slash training, and you can use AbilityNet webinar 10, um, a 10% 10 off discount code as a registrant of our webinar. Uh, the courses coming up um, include uh, this week, Don't Disable Me, Removing Physical Barriers and Digital, Disa digital Disability Awareness Training. Then we also have how to develop accessible, inclusive collaboration and teamwork, uh, a new course on digital accessibility legislation, and then next week, uh, how to deliver and sustain accessible digital learning for HE and FE professionals. And then if you could just move to the next slide, thank you. Um, we also have a number of e-learning modules for higher and further education institutions. You can find out more at forward slash e-learning dash modules. So if you'd like to discuss them, do get in contact. And we also have um, some HE and FE focused services, including the um, free McNaughton AbilityNet HE and FE maturity model, and also a suite of um, various accessibility services. And then just finally on the next slide, um, you can sign up to our newsletter at forward slash newsletter. And don't forget about our next free webinars at forward slash webinars. Uh, the next session is on the 26th of April, looking at COVID and reasonable adjustments. And um, that will be available to register for next week. So thanks again, Rob, Jenny, Teresa, Helen, and everyone that's joined us. And we'll be in touch with you soon. And please do fill out the feedback form that will um, appear at the end of the webinar. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. <laughs>